This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. See, we're always in a hurry to know. So the media is invited to and capitalizes upon the opportunity to speculate. Mm -hmm. You see, you speculate too much, and the speculation becomes truth instead of what actually is the truth. Yeah, I see that. You can see that happen all the time. You're right. Like, I know you're talking about how they select stories or create stories to, you know what I'm saying, just to, uh, I guess, rev up ratings and stuff like that. It's not really about the truth. It's about, you know, ratings and uh, money. Hey. Well, see, here's the bottom line on that. Adolf Hitler and his propaganda minister, Goebbels, said it. Joseph Goebbels, mm -hmm. you, tell a lie, you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and you can get anybody to believe it. And when you speculate long enough and loud enough, anybody believes it. So fake news becomes indistinguishable from what passes for ordinary news. Well, it's just like you talk about that. And I was thinking about what you just said. I was thinking about this, this all of a sudden, this interest in the O.J. Simpson case. How they basically like started rewriting the history on the O.J. Simpson case with these documentaries. And these uh, mini series on TVs. What what your thought about the O.J. Simpson case and how he's being presented now? Quite a, I knew quite a few of the people that mm -hmm. were involved in that. Some that were called as witnesses. Uh, I got to look at all of the evidence that they had. It introduced in trial, and let's put it this way: uh, they were so anxious to get somebody that it was ridiculously poorly done. Mm -hmm. uh, there was probable cause to indict somebody, but it wasn't O.J., it was Furman, the detective. Mm -hmm. What they say happened to Nicole and Goldman, uh, it wasn't A.J., it wasn't O.J. That man's innocent. Mm -hmm. They just wanted him done. And see, the uh, thing the media has not followed up on is four of the primary detectives uh, in the OJ case, got indicted for falsifying information, documents, planning evidence, it, and what they call the Rampart scandal. That's the Rampart's uh, precinct mm -hmm. in L.A. And they had to let, I think it was 128 people out of uh, prison who were innocent, but were in there because that group framed them. Mm. And see, that was the group responsible for that OJ investigation. Mm. So the media didn't cover up on that, you know, co uh, cover that. Well, also, I was, I mean, I saw a documentary a couple of years ago. There's a white guy on death row who said he actually killed Nicole and, and Ron Goldman. He's a serial killer from, I believe, Kentucky. And he's on death row in Florida right now. He, but he claimed that he killed Nicole and, and Ron Goldman that night. Look, look, from the pictures I saw, Nicole and Goldman got their throats slit from ear to ear. Somebody mm -hmm. reached in with a pair of pliers and pulled their tongues out through the slit throats. That's called the Colombian necktie. Mm -hmm. That is not OJ. There were two people. Somebody had a nine and a half uh, size nine and a half pair of shoes and somebody had a size 10. That was in the blood. OJ mm -hmm. wears a size 12. Mm -hmm. That if it does not fit, it will, should it quit? Right. Well, O.J. takes the XXL glove of the type that was involved. Uh, Furman takes a size large, which was what the glove was. I know the man who made the glove. His name is Richard Zuckerwar. Mm -hmm. Zuckerwar. Wow. So, so why, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Just. They, they called a good friend of mine who is uh, one of those top tier consultants for uh, the heavyweight types that you know, low drag, high speed operatives in the international intelligence community. They called him in as an expert on knife killing. He looked at their so-called animation that they wanted to show the jury. And he said, flatly, there's no way in hell that could have happened that way. Mm. Wow. And whoever did it was a professional. See, when you stab somebody, it's not like you see in the movies where somebody throws a knife, sticks the guy in the chest, and he goes, ugh, and collapses. Right. You see, the method of death, unless you strike the central nervous system or the brain, or you punch through the kidneys, 
that's what caused momentary paralysis is that the person has to bleed to death. So you stab a guy with a knife, he doesn't even feel like he's been hit. So mm-hmm. the guy that does the stabbing, unless he's a pro, goes, what the hell? You is this Superman? Nothing happens. Stabs him again. Nothing happens. Stabs him again. Nothing happens. Again and again and again and again. And by the time he's trying to stab the guy 15 to 40 sometimes, that accelerates the loss of blood and blood pressure, and then the guy collapses. But see, a pro comes in, he says, this is a fatal thing. He may not die instantly, won't die instantly, but I killed him. So he stabs him. Nicole and uh, Goldman got the same two stab wounds, which are fatal. And then they got the throats cut and the tongues pulled out. That ain't OJ. Right. But it was the Nicole, I'm going to ask you about the restaurant. I heard the, the restaurant that, you know, Ron Goldman worked at and Nicole dying at it had organized crime connections. And then Nicole's sister yeah. was dating a mob guy. Well, did you watch the trial? I remember, man, it was like 20 some years ago. Yeah, I watched some of the yeah, trial. Well, I tape recorded every single scrap of it in my chambers. I was a bachelor. Uh-huh. And I watched it every evening before I went home. Wow. There was extensive testimony from a remote location where they shouted in the faces that uh, where Judge Ito and the prosecution and the defense heard these two guys were in the federal witness protection program. And it was their understanding that Nicole and Goldman, Nicole specifically Goldman, just as a side chance, got done in to send them a message to keep quiet. Nicole's two sisters were romantically involved with these two individuals who were in the federal witness protection program. They wow. testified to that, but Edo did not allow the jury to hear it. Wow. So that was, they, they left out in the OJ thing they did on Fox. <laughs> God. So that's true. Wow. And that stuff about the DNA stuff, mm-hmm. uh, the testimony on that from the expert that the state didn't even know they had. Uh, the defense called him after, called him as their own witness, but it was interesting. He mm-hmm. was a state's witness. He was the instructor for two of the state's key witnesses on DNA. He said they were very poor students, but in his estimation, that was not OJ's seriological signature. It was somebody who had a similar background, but there were no less than 95,000 people in L.A. County that could have donated that signature DNA. He said it was somebody from an East Mediterranean, Northeast Mediterranean background, or perhaps from the island of Sicily. Oh, wow. That's, that's <laughs> with some <laughs> African American ancestry. <laughs> that was, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. So they let you know it was an organized crime. So they didn't really. Highlight that they you know, didn't allow that in the in the regular trial. You let the jurors hear that. Huh? Yeah. Now see what uh, Johnny Cochran did. And by the way, I met him back in 1966 out of UCLA. Great wow. man. Wow. Uh, what he did was uh, he selected a jury where a large percentage of the people on the jury were over 45 and had grown up in Los Angeles and were black. And they knew that LAPD had about as much trustworthiness as a snake getting ready to bite you. Right. No aspersions on current crop of police. I don't know none of them, but, uh, you know, at that time, LAPD had the reputation of lying as soon as they would breathe. And also, that's where the SWAT team come out of the LAPD, right? Colonel Parker, you know, that's why. Yeah, team. they did. <laughs> and see, Colonel. See, LAPD was known in the 50s for its corruption. Mm -hmm. So they passed an ordinance changed in L.A. where the chief would be in for life or good behavior. Mm -hmm. So they recruited somebody far away from the organized crime and corruption. And they Mm -hmm. got Chief Parker from Alabama. Okay. Now, in 1973, I happened to be in Jackson, Mississippi. And I pulled down an LAPD recruitment poster that I got off of a phone pole in Jackson, Mississippi, and sent it to some friends who have a crack home in L.A. So mm. they've got Los Angeles with a lot of Jews, Asians, Hispanics, uh, and black folk, and you're recruiting the police from Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Mm-hmm. 
So you had a novel situation in L.A. where the police ran City Hall. Hmm. Wow. And you got all of these people from Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and all of these places. It's like a Dixie Mafia over the West Coast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, just ordinary, but you see, you had just ordinary people, mm-hmm. whites who weren't doing so well, but California had this welfare system back then that was really strange. Mm-hmm. And they came out to LA to get jobs and settle in. So they got, you know, bewildered. Who are all of these Jews, black folk, brown folk, red, and yellow folk that are all in LA? So they moved out into the San Fernando Valley, which is on the other side of those mountains, eventually to Orange County, but they trusted their Southern brethren who were on LAPD to keep things safe. So LAPD ran LA wow. politically and otherwise. That's a man. So, so much history. Like Tom this. Bradley. Mm-hmm. Tom Bradley ran track at UCLA. Mm-hmm. He was in the Korean War and he became a lawyer. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't let him be a squad car rookie squad car cop until he became a member of the bar. Wow. And this is the future mayor of LA, right? Ran for governor? Yeah, future mayor of LA. Wow. So he wound up retiring as a captain and by a fluke got elected as uh, chairman of the retired policemen's association. So the clown he was running against the third time he ran for mayor was a character named Tom Yorty. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam Yorty, excuse me. And Yorty had only been in L.A. like 112, 120 days out of the last year, Mm. traveling all around, wasting money. And Yorty was campaigning on the issue of what you needed was a strong law enforcement type. So, hell, Bradley was the cop. So Mm. he got elected. Now, when I grew up, he patrolled my neighborhood. He was known as fair, but he had a reputation for having never lost a race down a back alley to whip somebody's head. Mm. Tell me, he would stop the squad car, get out and beat you with that nightstick and then ask you what you thought you were doing. Well, sorry, you made a mistake. Get your tacky butt on. Mm. But he would also talk to the grown folk in the neighborhood with his partner about, you know, understand there's some problems. Now, if you guys want to take care of it, uh, we can say we were having a meeting and you weren't there. Mm. So this like this would be the, the, the great example of what community policing would look like. You know, that's community yeah. policing. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, California was officially desegregated from day one, but they had stuff up no colored, you know, white only. Right. And the neighborhoods were segregated just because of economics. So L.A. was L.A. Mm-hmm. But, you know, 